Hi, my name is Adam. Welcome to the channel. Thanks for joining us today. Today, we're going to talk about tax-free savings accounts again. And I know I talk about them a lot, but you guys need to hear about it a lot. And, and last year, in 2021, we did a video called five TFSA mistakes you must avoid. And it was by far our number one video. So first off, thank you for the views. We really do appreciate it. But within that video, there's a lot of comments and questions at the bottom of it. And I wanted to take some time to go through those questions. So the first question is from Telestix. On point one, if you're listed as a beneficiary, but are a spouse, you can actually just apply to have it change. Yes, it's a bit more work, but you don't actually lose that opportunity. That is actually absolutely correct. Most of you already have a TFSA set up, but you probably didn't set your spouse or common law partner as a successor holder. You just set them up as a beneficiary. It's not too late to change that. Contact your financial institution. If you are married, if you have a spouse or common law partner, your spouse or common law partner should be listed as a successor holder, not a beneficiary. The next question comes from Donnyboy73, who leaves quite a bit of comments. So I appreciate that, Donnyboy. Uh, I read online that if someone makes too many stock trades or is day trading for the account, CRA may tax all the money you made. So there's no set guidelines around how many transactions you can do in a TFSA account. Now, if you're day trading it, I'm going to assume that the CRA will be after you. It, it's set up more as an investing account or a savings account. I mean, they call it a tax-free savings account. It's really a tax-free investing account. So it's set up as a long-term investment account. If you're in and out of a stock every day, that's day trading. If you buy something and hold it for a while and then transact it, you know, if you have 50 to 100 stocks in your portfolio and you want to kind of turn it over every three to six months, well, you're going to have more transactions. So, you know, I would say hold something more than a few weeks or months. I, I think if it's shorter than that, the CRA may be coming after that. And so be careful on that. So the next comment comes from Crystal Schmidt. She says, thanks for your great videos. Another TFSA mistake. Our financial planner told us years ago that we should open a TFSA, which we thought was a great idea. Unfortunately, we didn't realize that non-residents cannot contribute. And we see this all the time. And, you know, especially with dual citizens to the U.S., if you're a U.S. citizen living in Canada or a dual citizen, Canada sees a tax-free savings account as a true tax-free account. But in the U.S., they don't see the TFSA account as a tax-free savings account. So if you're a U.S. or dual, close down your TFSA account. It does not make sense to have. If you're looking to open up a TFSA account in simple terms, you need to be a Canadian living in Canada uh, or at least have Canadian residency. The next question comes from Bob Dubalina. Sorry if I said that wrong. Could you have two successor holders on your TFSA split evenly as in your kids? Well, first off, for a successor holder, it can only, it can only be a spouse or common law partner. Everyone else has to be a beneficiary. Obviously, you only have one spouse or one common law partner, so you can't split it necessarily. You could split the beneficiary successor holder. So if you want to leave half your TFSA to your spouse and half to a child, you could do that. Might be a little difficult. I've never seen it done. I don't see why you couldn't do it. I don't know why you'd want to do it. Probably better giving that TFSA to your spouse and finding assets elsewhere, have it written in the will where part of that would then be paid out. The next comment here comes from, um, I'm gonna say this wrong, Vyacheslav Savativ. And it says, another mistake is to hold very risky individual securities in your TFSA. If it goes to zero or, or, you, or the closed position, uh, you will have a permanent impairment of your TFSA room as the loss is not deemed a withdrawal. So right now in 2022, your TFSA room is $81,500. Let's say you put $50,000 into your TFSA and you invested in a high risk stock and it went to zero. You still have $31,500 that you can put into your TFSA. That's still available to you. Now, if you put that into a different stock and that grew to a million dollars, you still have a million dollar TFSA. So yes, your 50,000 went to zero and that Technically, that contribution room is lost temporarily, but you can gain it back by other investments. Now, if you put the whole 81,500 into a stock and it went to zero, then you'd have to wait till 2023, get your new $6,000 contribution room and start building it up. It would be very difficult to kind of build it up to your contribution room again. So with a TFSA, you actually earn or, or generate more contribution room from growth of the investment. So if your $81,500 goes to 100,000 and you cash it out out of your TFSA, the following year, you can put back in $100,000. And, that, and that's a big confusion as well. So the growth as well is new contribution room if you draw that out. The next question here comes from Jammer66, um, longtime subscriber. Uh, I've been told to have a long-term savings slash emergency fund TFSA and an investment TFSA. Is this a good idea to separate these com them completely or is it 
possible to not invest all the money in a TFSA as an emergency fund. Um, yeah, I mean, I've talked about this in a few other videos. You can definitely have more than one TFSA. You just make sure you don't put in more than your contribution room. So you could have kind of a short-term savings emergency fund TFSA and then an investment TFSA. Again, you know, does this make sense? Sure, it, it could. If you're not gonna maximize your TFSA and you have some extra money for an emergency fund, you can put it in your TFSA account. Again, if your high interest savings is earning you like 1% and you have $10,000 in there for an emergency fund, you're earning $100. Like, is there really a benefit to earning $100 tax-free versus taxable? I, I don't know, I, I don't think so. Now you could have that within one TFSA. You could have one TFSA account, say with $50,000 in there, invest 40 of it into you know, an ETF that's it's growing over time and 10,000 of it into like a high interest savings or something like that within that. So, you know, you could separate out those accounts or you could just put it under one account as well. But again, you don't wanna have too many accounts because when you get close to retirement, it gets really messy. In fact, we're just consolidating 18 accounts for a client right now. Way too messy, way too much work, way too much paperwork. Um, so start consolidating that much before retirement and don't put yourself in that uh, position in the first place. So the next question comes from Mark and, and this came up a few times here in the comments and questions but uh, does the investment interest made in a tfsa get counted as part of your contribution i.e if you have maxed out your tfsa of seventy-five thousand five hundred in 2021 does the interest earned impact your contribution allowance thanks mark uh so mark no it does not so if you max out your tfsa seventy-five thousand five hundred in 2021 and it earns interest capital gains dividends it, it builds up anything like that doesn't affect your contribution room. that's just counted as growth within the portfolio so that is all earned on a tax-free basis and does not affect your contribution room. i'm going to quickly go through two more questions uh, the next one's from reptilian skin the tfsa is my favorite account by the time i retire it's my plan that it'll be worth several hundred thousand and have significant dividend income for me to withdraw tax-free to help fund my retirement. And I couldn't agree more. The TFSA account is the most powerful investment vehicle that we have in Canada, bar none. There, there's nothing close to it. It is going to give you the flexibility in retirement um, that before TFSA account, we never really had. When you need extra money, you can pull it out of there and it's not driving up your income, clawing back old, old age security and all of that. Um, and if you have extra money, you can kind of put it in there if you have the contribution room. So it's kind of this lever account that you can pull back and forth and give you a lot of flexibility in retirement. If you're building up for retirement right now, you're probably focusing on an RSP, which is great. That's where your focus should be. But make sure that you're trickling into your tax or savings account as well to build that up because it's going to be a great, great tool. Trust me, I do plans every single day for retirees or you know people that are close to retirement. And I can tell you the people with a nice sized TFSA account have way more flexibility, both around income and savings on tax as they enter retirement. So start building up your TFSA for your retirement. The last question I want to cover in this video here, and it, it comes across my plate quite often, um, and it comes from Fred Duick. I made the mistake of moving my maxed out TFSA funds from the bank to an investment firm. Unbeknownst to me that CRA considered it over contributed. Fortunately, they waived the penalty this time. So I think what happened to Fred is he had a maxed out TFSA at the bank and he was moving it to an investment firm. And what he did is he cashed out the TFSA here and invested it over here. That you cannot do. If you're maxed out on your TFSA and you pull it out, you can't put that money back into the following calendar year. So if Fred had taken that out and just put it into the investment account over here, he would absolutely be over contributing because he has no contribution left. He had maxed it out already. So his investment firm should have been aware of that and not allowed him to do that. But at the end of the day, what you need to do is transfer. There's something called a T2033. And that's a registered transfer form. And that would transfer his account from the bank over to the investment firm without actually selling it and buying it back in. Um, you can transfer it in cash or in kind. In cash means that you're gonna sell anything that you hold currently in your TFSA. It's gonna stay in cash, but stay in your tax-free savings and move over to the new investment firm. In kind is whatever you own currently in your tax-free savings, that's what will be transferred to the new investment firm. Again, depending where you're transferring it from and transferring it to, the new investment firm may not be able to hold the current investments that you're sitting in. Now, here's a tip for you. Most investment firms charge a transfer fee, anywhere between 25 and up to $150 to transfer a registered account like a TFSA. If you do get charged that, ask the place that you're going to. Most of them will refund you. Not all of them, but some of them will refund you that fee. I know a lot of the firms that we've used in the past will refund that fee. So hey, 
The client gets charged $50, we'll refund it on the other side. Anyway, hopefully this video helped you out. Hopefully we answered some of the questions. And again, if you have more questions beyond that, leave a comment below. Um, I'll do my best to answer that within a timely fashion. If you enjoyed this, please hit the thumbs up. If you're not already subscribed to the channel, hit the subscribe button. It takes you one second. It costs you absolutely nothing. Uh, we'll see you in the next video.